Hi, welcome to this masterclass where we're going to talk about how to integrate mental health in your work, work culture. As you're watching, you're probably aware of the fact that mental health is a hot topic, but how to actually integrate this in your work culture, work, work culture sorry, can be a different story. My name is Jesper Viveen and I'm your host for today. And in the next 30 minutes, we're going to watch uh, Emma, Emma White, psychologist of Open Up, talk about this topic. But before I'm going to hand over the mic to her, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the agenda of today. We're going to start with why it is important to integrate mental health into your workplace. Next, we're going to talk about the plan, the plan for a mentally health work culture. The third topic is going to be the importance of involving the entire organization, which can be something that's challenging. And lastly, we're going to talk about how to actually enabling these people within the organization. I hope you're ready. Enjoy. And I'm going to hand over the mic to Emma. Okay, thank you, Jesper, for the introduction. So let's dive together into the why it is so important to integrate mental health into your work culture. Well, according to CBS numbers, our mental health has been declining in the past years, with now one in six people in the Netherlands indicating that they are feeling mentally unwell where we especially see a trend in young adults and an increasing trend in young women. But it's not only in the Netherlands that we're seeing this. Statistics from around the world are demonstrated that it's estimated that one in six have experienced a common mental health challenge in the past week. Which is hardly surprising given the years of pandemic that we've just had, growing concerns about climate change and of course inflation affecting us all. But we're also seeing these mental health challenges increasing um, in the workplace and that people are also there struggling with their mental health. We see that the average sick leave is now 4.8%, which is a 7% increase from 2020, where it was 4.5%. So what does this 4.8% mean? It, it means that for every 100 working days per employee, 4.8 of these days were used as sick day leaves. Well, and of these sick day leaves, almost 30% of them are caused by psychological complaints. And of that 30%, 13.9% of employees' last sick leave was mainly or partly caused by their work. So this demonstrates that feeling mentally unwell is a growing concern and has negative consequences for any organization and its employees. And uh, what Jesper said at the beginning, it is a hot topic and it is an urgent theme. But for us to really understand how to address this challenge, we first need to understand a little bit better what the causes are and the consequences of poor mental health at work. This is what we're going to dive into a bit more together. So looking at the causes of poor mental health at work, we see that there's two types of causes or risks, as we'd like to call them. The first is organizational risks. As you see on the slide, it could be a combination of high expectations at work with low salaries or a high pressure that's experienced, but a little influence that they're able to exert could be low experience justice, that things feel unfair at work and that that's causing stress. It could be that you have a bad relationship with your supervisor. Um, a high threshold to open a discussion about mental health challenges is something that can be posed as a risk. And also any stigmas regarding mental health. So it might be seen as a taboo or emotions might not be something that's easily discussed. But there's also personal risks, so really coming from the employee. Um, this could be the amount of stress that they're under and the ability that they have to cope with this stress. So really their coping mechanisms. 
but we also see that certain personal characteristics in employees um, increase their susceptibility to developing a mental health challenge. This could be high degree of neuroticism, which is linked to low emotional instability, um, a low degree of extroversion, a high degree of responsibility, and a low degree of wanting to collaborate with others. And it's hardly ever a case of just organizational risks or just personal risks. We often see it's a combination of the two that in the end leads to somebody feeling mentally unwell and the potential for sick leave. And to demonstrate this, um, you could see, as you see on the slide, a bucket which could represent the personal risk. So if we have an employee, the personal risks here could be the amount of stress that they're under and their ability to cope with the stress. So that's really the bucket. And in the bucket, you have the organizational risks. So this could be that they have a bad relationship with their supervisor and that's causing stress, that within their team, they're not experiencing the openness to talk about this difficult relationship that they're having. And if you add another deadline on top of that, that could cause the water in the bucket to overflow and spill. And that's when you get mental health challenges and the possibility of sick leave. So always a combination of the two. If that was the causes. Let me walk you through what then the consequences are, or what the consequences can be for your organization by looking at the negative consequences of employees feeling mentally unwell. So the most obvious one, of course, is sick leave. Um, this impacts the health of the employee, which you don't want and which is bad for the employee, but it also impacts the financial side of your organization as well. We see that an average sick leave is 180 days and the ASR Rekentool, as stated on the slide, says that per day that an employee is on sick leave, it costs roughly 250 euros. And that is then, of course, paying the salary and the company doctor, but it doesn't take into account, for example, a loss of productivity, an impact on the team, the added work pressure that might be there. So if you then do a quick calculation and you say, okay, the average sick leave is 180 days and it costs 250 euros per day, this can lead up to, per employee that's on sick leave, a cost of 45,000 euros. But sick leave isn't the only impact and negative consequence. We also have a topic called presenteeism, and this is something that we hear less about, but is actually something that might be doing more harm to your employees and your organization. And this is when employees are attending work, but they're on their reserves, and they're just at that tipping point before they go on a sick leave. So you can maybe see this in that they're becoming more sloppy and more messy, that they're making mistakes, that uh, they're getting conflicts with, um, with colleagues, and that they're making mistakes and misjudgments at work as well. And Deloitte dived into this, and in their research it states that more than half of mental health-related employees' costs are caused by presenteeism. However, it's also important to look at what the benefits are of employees feeling mentally resilient. So this isn't just the absence of illness, it is employees feeling their best, feeling that they're thriving. And research shows that this can go a lot further than just the benefits that there are for the company's financials. Because, of course, research shows that when you have a good mental health, there is less absence, there is less presenteeism, um, but it also leads to an increase in creativity and innovation, um, which leads to better problem solving skills and that people feel more engaged and therefore are more likely to stay. And that's of course a visitor pass or a nice uh, branding of the company to attract new people to come and work there as well. We are seeing that there is an increasing cultural trend in organizations to improve the awareness and acceptance for taking care of employees' mental health, a trend that aims to create a space for more open and safer conversations and provide a better options for care for employees. And this is a trend which is great, but we feel that there's more that can be done that's been doing at the moment. So we often see that people have mental health programs and uh, they have company doctors and they have all these different things that they kind of add on on top of the company. But we're seeing if we really want to accelerate this trend, we need to really exert what we can into the work culture. 
And uh, the goal then for companies should be to build this non-judgmental, open and supportive culture where people feel that mental health and well-being is something that they can talk about, seek help for and nurture within themselves without any repercussions. Sounds great, this is what we want, but how do we get there? Well, and that is what we're going to dive into the next topic. So how to plan for this mentally healthy work culture. Well, given that organizational factors, like I explained before, play such a large role in the mental health of employees, it is important as HR, as team leads and as management to make mental health a top priority which needs to be more than just saying it is important, but also showing that it is important. And when we were also diving into this topic and what we hear from other HR professionals is that most articles that you read about this topic emphasize, of course, the importance of employee support programs or integrating mental health into your engagement surveys and any other kind of resilience or mental wellness programs that you can integrate into your company. And that by offering these resources and the information that employees can take the responsibility and that you're doing what you can. Well, first of all, of course, we need these things. This is kind of the basis of mental health in your organization. But we see that more is needed and can be done to make mental health part of your work culture and to involve all the people in your organization. So, how do you then approach this? Well, we have a diagram that we'd like to share with you from Deloitte. And in the diagram, you see four different areas that are related to mental health in your organization. So just to zoom in and understand this a little bit more and how this relates to work culture, we have four areas here. On the left hand side, we see what's the obligation. So these are the approaches that are used to prevent harm to your employees. So in the bottom left, we see support. So that's about providing the right access and appropriate workplace and clinical support to your um, employees. What I just discussed, that's the bare essentials that you need for your organization. But then we also have the protect space, which a lot of companies already do. So really identifying the risk to mental health and well-being and to eliminate or minimize at the source where it is predictable. But if we move to the other side, we see the opportunity side. That's about the foster and the reclaim, where reclaim is restoring the mental health and well-being of individuals and teams, maybe after a tough deadline or a difficult period that the team has gone through. But also the foster, where it's about developing the mental health and well-being of individuals and teams to, to thrive and become their best selves. And this is where we see that so much more can be done and that we can do this through the work culture. And that, of course, by doing that, you also empower the support and protect part of this diagram. Because ultimately, what Deloitte also says in their research on this, we need all four of these areas in your mental health strategy. So work culture is an answer to tapping into these opportunities. But what does work culture then exactly entail? I think it's good just to get on to the same page and how we view this. Well, I really love this definition from Great Place to Work. If you're interested, they have loads of engagement surveys and information uh, regarding culture, engagement and mental health as well. And they define uh, work culture as an organization culture, defines how things get done in the organization where the culture consists of shared values and beliefs which are communicated and reinforced through various methods, which ultimately shape employees' perceptions, behaviors, and understanding. And that through this, you can then create a culture where people feel safe, seen, heard, and connected, which contributes to that mentally healthy work culture that we're striving for. Based on this, the first route that we recommend you as an HR professional to take to integrate mental health into your work culture is to translate your company values to concrete skills and behaviors that promote a mentally healthy work culture. Because how we perceive our work culture ultimately depends on how we interact with each other and how that enables mental health and how we feel mentally healthy in our culture. Now, I'm going to go through a really high level, step-by-step -step plan um, that are tools for you to get started on this topic. 
I personally would recommend if you just grab a pen and paper and as I go, you can write the answers to the questions yourself and how it applies for your organization. Um, you can pause this video if you want, if you just want to take the time, or you can just write down the questions and visit them later. But I just wanted to uh, mention that I think that could be really helpful during this masterclass. So what does this step-by-step -step plan look like? We start with the company values. So maybe you already have this defined in your organization or that is something that you still want to do. In this masterclass, I'm going to start at the place where you know what your company values are. So what are they? Um, if I can give an example, and that's what I'm also going to do through this plan to make it come more alive. If I look at Open Up, one of our values is being stronger together. So if I have that value, it's then interesting to see, okay, so how does this value behave and what does it look like in the organization? We often see that it's helpful to have interviews with different roles and people within the organization to really understand what this value means. You can, for example, speak to leadership and how they embody this value and uh, what does the value look like in action for them with management, with individual contributors or any other different roles. So when you do these interviews and you collect all the information, you're going to see that some things overlap and you're going to see that some words and statements are going to really jump out for you. And from that, you can then define, okay, based on these interviews and based on this company values, what are the skills that are then needed to execute this value? So going back to the example of Open Up, where the value is stronger together, the skills needed to be stronger together could be collaboration, empathy, and openness. Okay, so great, these are these skills, but it's still not completely concrete. What does this look like in practice? How am I going to see in the behavior of the people around me that they're exerting these behaviors that will ultimately lead to that mentally healthy culture? Well, then you ask yourself the question, what behaviors are needed to hone these skills? Well, looking at the skills of collaboration and empathy and openness um, in Open Up, it could be listening, asking questions, checking in with each other. How are you today? How was your weekend? Having those ongoing feedback conversations and not like those set moments throughout the year, but every week with each other or every time there's been something to discuss that we give feedback to each other. And also being open to try new things. Okay, so then you have clear what is your company value, you have clear what skills are needed to really execute this value, and then what behaviors are then needed to really show these values in action. An important next step, so the fourth step, is then to ask the question, how does this value, how do these skills and behaviors promote a mentally healthy work culture? So this is really going to be that link between the behavior and the values and skills you want to see and the work culture. So if we look at open up at the stronger together value and the skills and behaviors I've just discussed, our answer to this question would be genuine open interest to one another, checking in on how people are doing, having that willingness to listen to each other and share thoughts, promotes an environment where people feel safe, seen, heard and connected and ultimately connects to that mentally healthy work culture that we're striving for. So those are the important steps to take, and you'd actually do this for each of the values that you have within your company. So then you're going to have this backbone of values that you can then use in the different processes and places in your organization. And you want to do this because then you can promote these behaviors and you can give the chance to the employees to develop these behaviors. So you could promote it into your performance cycles. So how you evaluate people's behavior and skills and how you center your feedback conversations around these behaviors. You can integrate uh, this information into your learning and development or learning and training offering by offering trainings and workshops on these valued skills and behaviors so that people can develop themselves in it. You can integrate it in how you communicate and what you communicate within and outside of your organizations by sharing success stories based on these values or challenges and what people have learned from them. You can integrate the values into your newsletters and updates that are given. And also in recruitment, of course, it could be as simple as integrating the values into the vacancies that you put online. Or it could be, and it could be that you recruit uh, candidates who embody these values and show these skills and behaviors. 
So following these steps, you can work from company values to the concrete behaviors, make that live in your organization so that that can promote that mentally healthy work culture. But to ensure that you're not doing this alone and that you have management and leadership support in making and keeping a mentally healthy work culture a top priority, a next route you can take is to determine how the company values, the skills and behaviors enable your business strategy. So company values as enablers of your business strategy to promote that mentally healthy work culture. Now this is really key to ensure that it cannot be anywhere else than on the agenda of leadership because it's part of getting to where the company wants to be. Well, also here, a high level step-by-step -step plan um, where you would start with finding a leadership sponsor. So somebody in leadership who really can represent the topic of mental health in leadership discussions and across the company. Ideally, somebody who walks the talk regarding their own mental health and how they treat the mental health of others, that they're really the ambassador of this topic and therefore can ensure that in all these leadership discussions and management discussions and with teams, it is kept a top priority. So when you've defined this leadership sponsor, then together you're going to define how do the values and the skills and behaviors that you have uncovered promote our business strategy. So coming back to the example of open up, stronger together was our value. Our answer to this question would be, we are stronger together. And by taking care of each other, by experiencing a work environment where you are seen and heard, that this impacts our engagement and our motivation and of course then the work pleasure that we experience and ultimately our performance. All of this enabling us to be this great place to work whilst achieving our business goals. Where it almost becomes secondary that we're achieving our business goals because we're so motivated by how we're feeling and how the company works and how we interact together that the business goals come automatically. When you have defined this, you then go and research what the status quo is in your organization. So what is up with mental health in your organization? How is everybody doing in this space? It's really important to get this baseline management because that is where your first point from where you're going to start taking actions. So this baseline management could be an engagement survey that you already have, or an example that could be used is Tiny Pulse Survey or Quantum Workplace, where you get input on how employees are doing. So you get a feel for that in the organization. But it's also about plotting what resources do you already have in place? How are these resources already being used? And what maybe illness data, sickness data, or any other mental related health data can you use to sketch this picture of the status quo? When you start analyzing this data, you're going to see how everybody is doing, and you're going to see what is needed. What is needed based on the data that we are seeing what interventions would fit? Where do we want to target? What are the risks factors that we're seeing? Based on this, you can start creating together what objectives and goals that you want to achieve regarding mental health. And it's really important to have these goals because then it's easier to keep it a priority. And by setting these goals, make sure there's a way of measuring your progress towards these goals. So how are you doing every quarter? How are you doing every six months or every year? And if you have applied a goal where a certain intervention is needed, okay, how is the intervention doing? What is the return on investment? How is that impacting how people are feeling? By doing this data-driven approach, you can proactively keep track of this topic. You can proactively keep track of the goals. You can use timely interventions. And as a famous Bill Gates once said, what gets measured gets done. So doing this in this space with this data-driven approach with that leadership sponsor, you're ultimately more able to keep this an important proactive priority on the agenda of the company. Okay, so zooming out, we've talked about how to plan for a mentally healthy work culture. And we've looked at two different routes that you can take in your organization both of them are needed, where well, the first one is a route of translating company values into concrete skills and behaviors, which you can then use as a backbone for all aspects of your organization. And the second is the route of integrating mental health into your 
business strategy, really enabling mental health as an enabler of your business strategy in order for it to continue to be a top priority for leadership and across the company. Our next topic that I just shortly want to touch upon, but it is very important, um, is the importance of involving the entire organization in creating this mentally healthy work culture. Research shows that to build this mentally healthy workplace, you need a bottom-up approach as well as a top-down approach, where bottom-up is from the individual contributors and um, team members to management and management to leadership and top-down is from leadership to management to individual contributors and team members. However, despite we know that we need this, in practice we often see that both these approaches are not happening or only one of them is happening and that ultimately not the whole organization is on board in mental health and what you can do in that space. For example, one survey found that more than half of employees feel uncomfortable talking to their managers and supervisors about mental health. And that many managers don't feel equipped to discuss mental health with their team members. But if employees don't feel that they can open up uh, to their managers about how they're feeling, and the managers don't know how to hold the conversation about this, things are going to be left unsaid and a lot of employees might be suffering in silence. And it is something that you definitely want to avoid and is something that you as HR professional can really play an important role in preventing this. Just taking a sip of water before we go to the next slide. Okay. So then we're going into you as HR professional, how can you then enable people within the organization to create this mentally healthy work culture? Well, as I said, from leadership to new joiners, everyone plays a role in the work culture. And like I've also said before, people often know the importance of mental health, but they're just not really sure how to act upon it and therefore don't do it. So to enable the entire organization, we have these three key things that we feel that are important important to do when enabling the entire organization. Where with any change that you want to achieve, it starts with awareness. Awareness across the entire organization of what mental health is, what is the role that everybody plays regarding mental health, and how do you enable this mentally healthy work culture. Within this awareness, providing trainings to the entire workforce on this topic can really empower employees to increase their understanding of mental health and collectively contribute to the development of a positive and supportive workplace culture. The second topic is role modeling. So having those role models in the organization and spotlighting them on how to take care of yourself and how to take care of each other. This could also be integrated with those skills and behaviors that you value within the organization, that they embody them and that that is shown across the organization. The third is to keep people engaged. So you can have the awareness, you can have the role models, but it's important to keep this an ongoing conversation and an ongoing priority where that data-driven approach that we discussed can really be an enabler for this. So these are the three important aspects of enabling people within your organization. But we do see that for the different roles within the organization, a slightly different approach is needed for the awareness, the role modeling, and keeping people engaged. So I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into this to just give some input and tips in what could help to enable the different roles within your organization. To start with the team members and individual contributors. So important to realize that their impact is on themselves and their direct colleagues. Therefore, it's important to train them in the mental health awareness, so what it is and how it impacts them and the organization, but also in recognizing mental health challenges in themselves and how they can ideally preventatively deal with them. Besides that, of course, also offering the trainings and um, promoting the trainings of the valued skills and behaviors that contribute to that mentally healthy work culture. 
other things that we see that can really help in keeping people engaged on the topic is just having that one slider that you can share across your organization of the different types of support that you offer regarding mental resilience and mental health. It could be just somebody's first point of contact regarding mental health, but also any other resources and information that you have. What we also see that works really well in organizations is having some form of a focus group or an ally network regarding mental health. You could, this could be a network of ambassadors who come together once in a while to discuss any signals that they're seeing, any challenges that they're seeing regarding mental health, which can give really interesting and important input to you as HR professional, to leadership, but also to create that safe space for people to, to talk about the topic and to, to, to keep them engaged on the topic. So that's the team members and individual contributors. The next role is managers. Important takeaway here is that managers are the spiders at the center of the web when it comes to employee mental health. And we often see in organizations that the role they play is underestimated and that too much focus is being put on having role models in leadership who can often feel too far removed from the individual team members and individual contributors. So also here, it's really important to identify role models who can be part of that conversation of mental health, whether it's with leadership or in those ally networks, and who can be promoted as ambassadors of mental health in, for example, communications that are sent out. Here with managers, of course, the awareness training could help them in uh, enabling them to, to signal mental health challenges in themselves and in others. But um, as the difference was of individual contributors, where the focus was mainly on themselves and awareness, with managers, it's really important to enable them to signal challenges in others and to know how to open up a conversation about mental health with team members. We often see that people or managers find that difficult and therefore will push the responsibility back to the employees when they're actually doing that out of not knowing what to do. So it's really important to enable them in that space. Um, and besides all of those things, we see what works really well in organization is to create toolkits for the managers, where you could have certain check-in exercises that you can do with their teams, at a, a maybe like a, a stoplight exercise where you can say, are you in red, orange, or green today, and why is that? So you can get an easy way of getting input of how people's teams are doing. If you could have a summary of pointers for having that mental health conversation in this toolkit can be really helpful. Of course, that one slider with resources is good to have. And maybe some kind of ideas or pointers that you can share about how they can open up about their own mental health, their own challenges and successes in that space, which taps into that role model um, topic that we also find important for managers. The last role within the organization that we still want to touch upon is leadership. Well, leadership plays a very important role in creating that psychologically safe environment for people to feel safe, to share how they are feeling, that they dare to be vulnerable, and that to lead by example in the behaviors that are valued by the company. Well, we've talked about the leadership sponsor role, that's important to have in leadership, but there's no stopping you in defining and finding other role models within le leadership who can also be ambassadors, who walk the talk and re can represent mental health. The sponsor and these role models is really their role to make sure that mental health remains that priority within the organization. These role models can also help enable other people in leadership to walk the talk. So that's also an impo yeah, important kind of oil spill role that they can play. And regarding leadership, it's also important to enable them to walk the talk. So you can create a leadership specific mental health training. Um, often companies do this with a supplier or with a vendor to really make it tangible and um, helpful for the leader. So it will be a different training than, for example, you'd give to individual contributors or team members, where you can really openly discuss the challenges that they face and the things that they can do in the role that they have. It's also always useful to integrate certain data from your own organization regarding mental health into these trainings. We see that that really helps to get them on board on the topic. And just as with managers, to create a leadership-specific toolkit that can 
help them uh, act upon any mental health challenges that they see in themselves or in others. And of course, a key role that leadership plays is based on the data that you collect and that you track, what benefits are needed to have that discussion and decisions with them? What do we need to offer our employees to help them feel mentally well? What other interventions might be needed based on the data? And based on the data, then, of course, to track the progress and impact. So coming to the end of this section, we've looked at why it's important to involve the entire organization, that the step of awareness, role modeling, and keeping engaged is really important, and that it's a slightly different approach for individual contributors and team members, managers, and leadership. And so we've already arrived at the end of the presentation part of the masterclass, and we will dive a bit deeper into this topic during the Q&A. I'll see you there. Thank you, Emma, and welcome to the Q&A section of uh, this masterclass. Uh, before I'm going to ask you some questions, I want to highlight the, the possibility to actually ask questions in the chat. Uh, it's on the right side on the YouTube channel. Ask your questions and we will get them on this nice iPad in front of me here so that I can ask them uh, here live to Emma. Very interesting story, very interesting topics, I think also very important, mm -hmm. especially the part of uh, enabling the entire organization, and I'm sure uh, or at least uh, there were already a few questions coming in before the masterclass started also about this. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope that there's also some questions from the live audience on it. Um, so I just want to take off with, uh, uh, with focusing on the leadership part that mm -hmm. you already talked about. Because um, what we often hear also talking to HR professionals is uh, finding that leadership sponsor is an important step, mm -hmm. but it can be a tough step. So I, want, I wondered if you have some tips on how to open that conversation with somebody in the leadership team. I think that's a really interesting question. I think really relevant, Von. I think within that question, it's also good to take maybe one more step back and how do you even identify somebody, right, before you can open yeah. the conversation. So I think with identifying, it's really also looking to you as an HR professional to use a bit of your intuition here as well. So you're going to be working intensely together with this person. So ideally somebody that you have that click with and that you know that they embody that aspect of mental health. Um, so when you have maybe somebody or other people in mind, sometimes it helps to also discuss with the CEO of the company, like who would you have in mind for this role? Um, and then of course also use the input that you have and the ideas that you have of who that could be. Um, when you have together or by yourself decided who that is, indeed opening the conversation, I mean, the most experience that I've heard from people is that people are actually really enthusiastic to work on this topic because if you have the person that you already have the click with, they're already passionate about the topic, it's almost always a yes, let's do it. And it's also a way of um, promoting that person in the leadership group, right, as somebody who is really passionate about this topic, so it gives somebody a fixed role within the group. Um, so. Yeah, I think those would be the things that yeah. I would suggest. And maybe as an extra step, because uh, what we've all experienced with some of the clients that we have is that they go on to the work, uh, in the workplace, and then they just ask employees as well, like, who would you like really to, good idea. <laughs> to yeah. hear something about? Because yeah. uh, uh, yeah. often, as you said, the distance to the leadership team can be big, yeah. uh, and they can be seen as maybe not even human, while they are, of course, human. Uh, so it is also a very interesting yeah. uh, one maybe to, to look at. Yeah, I really like that idea. You also spoke about toolkits. Yes. Um, 
and to give the leadership team a toolkit. W what does that look like? Do you have examples of what you should put in that toolkit? Yes, yeah, so I think I gave a few examples in the masterclass, but I can elaborate on that. So it could be really simple things as just like a one slider with what are the steps to keep in the back of your mind when you're having a conversation with somebody about mental health or how to approach. So to make that more concrete, often we see that when people come to us with problems, we go into solution mode. Okay, have you thought of this? And can you do this? And have you talked to this? When often the biggest need when somebody comes and reach out to you with a challenge that they're facing is just somebody there who can listen and could be empathetic. So these small things that can just keep people in check and having that on a slide or in some kind of, uh, yeah, often it's a PowerPoint slide toolkit, but you can, of course, also make it tangible and make it an actual toolkit, but that can really help um, people in, in, yeah, really walking the talk regarding mm -hmm. mental health. And I think those exercises that you can do with your team. So often you see that, especially in this more hybrid way of working, that people uh, go straight into the content in whatever meeting that they might have with their team. But if you can start with a short check-in exercise, like, okay, so based on the weather, how is everybody doing today? Ooh, I'm feeling pretty stormy, or I'm a ray of sunshine today. And that gives input on how your team is doing. So that's also something that you could put in that toolkit. Is it also a way that you can open conversations one-on-one, -on -one, or is that? Yes, definitely. So I think that's um, also a way that you could start the conversation if that's something that, that works for you and you feel comfortable with doing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's also something that we hear often is like, if you see somebody or you, you recognize singles, yeah. or signals, but then opening the conversation to start talking about that. Yeah. So what we often hear is that uh, you also named managers as an mm -hmm. important uh, player in, in uh, living and breeding uh, mental health in the work culture. Um, that they feel or they, they have the feeling, I'm not a psychologist. Is, is this my, my job? Am I not interrupting people's personal lives? Yeah. Uh, do you have a, a, maybe a tip or something for people that have that in yeah. their head? Well, first of all, to normalize that, I think that's very normal because it just shows that you have the best intentions, right? Because you really want to help someone. But that comes back to the fact that we often managers don't feel that they are able to do that and they don't know what they're supposed to do. So... So your question was what tips you have to open that conversation? Well, to make it to easier for you s yourself, maybe as a manager, yeah. to, to start that conversation. Yeah. I think just expressing objectively the things that you've been seeing. So if it's any change, so not necessarily saying something about the person, but saying, hey, I just wanted to check in on how you're doing. I've noticed this happening, this happening. And for me, that signals a change in what I usually see from you. So I just want to, based on that, check in on how you're doing. People will often say, yeah, I'm fine, I'm good. And then to ask the questions, but how are you really doing? And that really gives permission to people like, ah, okay, this is, I think, a space where I can share that because they're really interested in how you're doing. Often managers will feel like relief, like, oh, they're good, I asked a question. But just asking that second question can really lower the threshold for somebody to like, yeah, actually, I might not be doing so great. And how are you really feeling? Is that, uh, do you have other ways also to ask that? Is it okay to ask it that directly? Because I can imagine that that feels yeah. a little bit like, okay, now you're really going into yeah. that personal space. Well, then you could also give it more of an introduction, the question like, oh, I hear you saying you're fine, but um, I just have this feeling there might be more going on. Um, yeah. And then kind of asking the question, so I want to just want to check, how are you really doing? Yeah. I think if you keep in mind that whatever you're doing is from the best intentions and that you also mention that in the conversation, that that's a way of really kind of, yeah, showing that you're not kind of scrutinizing somebody, but you're really just trying to be there for somebody. Yeah. Hey, and uh, there might be a point where you as a manager you cannot help somebody uh, or you have the feeling that you are not the right person to help. How do you then deal with helping that person further by, for example, outside help or is that... Is that also a conversation that's easy to, to open with an employee? Um, well, often it's not easy, but um, what you can do or what we often advise people to do is to ask the employee what they feel that they need. Hmm. Again, you often when somebody comes to you with a problem or a challenge, you feel this urge to want to solve it for them, but often they know what's best for them. So asking the question first, what do they feel that they need? and seeing what comes out of there. 
and then coming back to any form of toolkit or information that you have about the resources available inside or outside the company to then just look at that together and based on what's going on with them to look, okay, what would be the resource that would fit best with what you're experiencing at the moment? Thank you. I think we have, we've really dived into a few of the toolkit things now. I want to take a little bit step back. Yeah. Um, you talked about three things that are very important to enable people awareness, role models, and uh, keeping, keeping them engaged. Mm -hmm. And I think especially the last one can be tough, keeping them engaged. Um, and somebody asked the question, what if you've lost that part? You've been pretty good at that, but then you feel that engagement slipping away. Do you really need to start back in the basics again? Or can you pick up at the engagement part again? So the question is when you feel people in the company were really engaged, but the engagement on the topic is becoming less. Yes. Is that necessarily a, a bad thing or do you need to then start with awareness again and yeah, you still have yeah. the role models in place probably? Mm, good question also. I think it's then interesting to first find out why. So why are they becoming less engaged? You could have the open conversation with different people who was maybe in some kind of ally group that you have or the usual people that were more engaged on the topic to figure out what's going on here. Why is it becoming less engaged? And based on that, you can then take certain actions. Um, so I think that would be a really good place to start. And is that sort of a round table situation or an intervision or? Oh, honestly, it could be anything. I mean, you could just have a one on one, like a quick chat at the coffee machine or just like a 15 minute call. Hey, I just have some questions for you. But if you have some kind of more formal network in place, um, then it's also a place to open the discussion there. Um, I often feel that people are more open to share if it's one on one. Okay. Yeah. Less diffusion of responsibility to say what's really up. Uh. Yeah. Um, <coughs> uh, and you've sp you talked about the circle, protect, support, reclaim and foster. Um, we also talked to a lot of, of companies that they have all kinds of services in place. But one of the challenges is that people don't use them. Um, do you have tips to make, is that part of the enabling? Is that part, like, do you have tips on how people st can start using these services actually? Mm, yes. So I recognize this. I remember in my former company that I was like, we have this? I didn't know we had this. So a lot of, I think, uh, information gets lost. So within companies, especially when they're growing or they're already really large, there's so much communication going around all the time that you can better just repeat the information <clears throat> really often, whether it's in weekly updates or stand-ups that you have, in newsletters that be sent out, that this one slider is sent out every quarter, that it's continuously something that's kept attention to, so that then people at least know of the resources that are there. And um, what, I also s what we also see often is that there is a, um, how do you say that? People don't know what they need or don't know what they want. Yeah. So maybe putting things in place to sort of have a direction yeah. for them. Yeah, I think what really could help there is you can almost create like on that one side, like a decision tree yeah. of what is the kind of challenge, different questions. And then based on that, to get to a certain resource that can in maybe states of overwhelm or people not already thinking really clearly or stress or whatever challenge that they're facing can really help them decide what's the best resource to first reach out to. Cool, thank you. Um, I think this is a, a fun question. I'm also looking at the time to uh, maybe close off with. Okay. Um, do you have examples of walk the talk? You've, have you mentioned like as a leadership, uh, you need to really walk the talk, or as a manager, yeah. you might need to walk the talk. What are example things that you, where you recognize, hey, these people are? Um, I remember in uh, one of my former jobs, there was a leadership sponsor who really embodied mindfulness and would sometimes do mindfulness exercises with his team or the community event would do something on stage with everybody, really showing something that really helps them and wanting to bring it to others. So I think that could be an example, but that's of course a big example, but it could also be that when you're doing that team check-in with each other that you as manager or individual contributor or leader state, you know what, I'm pretty rainy today. You know why? Because I had this, 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 and this. And then you're also kind of 
you know, what you give is what you get back. So if you can show your vulnerability and that you're also human and face challenges, it's more likely that others are going to share yeah. that as well. Yeah. I actually have a, there's a very cool example where, where OpenUp also ha had a conversation or a psychologist of OpenUp had a conversation uh, at Bestseller with their former uh, head of e-commerce, Chris Byrne. Mm -hmm. and, and they had a 15 minute talk about mental health and he was very open and very uh, generous and he shared a lot of his personal uh, life yeah. and the things that he puts in place to actually work on his mental health. And I think the very cool thing there is that uh, the next, the weeks following uh, after that interview, employees actually came up to their HR department oh, wow. asking, can we, are there, is there more interviews coming? Can, can I be interviewed? Oh, can, that's huh? so cool. And I think yeah. that's also very uh, in line with what you're saying. Exactly. You show that you're vulnerable, also talk about it yourself. That is a very exactly. first good step yeah. to walk the talk. And often leaders or managers don't feel that they can be. So by really having those steps that we talked about in the masterclass of awareness and role model engagement, <clears throat> you're going to give them permission to do that and therefore yeah. permission to others. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I you're hope uh, everybody learned a lot from the steps and I'm sure we're going to have more masterclasses uh, where we will see you uh, explain a little bit more on maybe also on these topics. Um, for now, I want to thank you for watching. I hope uh, Emma shared a lot of valuable lessons and uh, we hope to see you uh, again next time. Thank you.